Aloha, you're listening to Chad Ford's NBA Big Board on the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm with the Athletics' Tony Jones. We're back and to talk 2022 NBA Draft. Here we go. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. He's the Athletics, Tony Jones, coming to us live from Las Vegas at the Summer League. I'm Chad Ford, and Tony and I spent all last year talking about the 2021 NBA Draft. Uh, We're still talking about the 2021 NBA Draft because Summer League's going on right now. We're actually getting to see these guys play um, with their respective teams. And so let's, let's kick off the show, Tony. You know, a lot of being made right now. We got to see Cade Cunningham go head to head with Jalen Green, the number one, number two pick in the draft. Uh, they've only played a couple of games, very small sample size, really to to figure out anything. And and there's three rules that I talk about in summer league. One, we're going to overreact. We shouldn't, but we're gonna uh, to small sample size. Two, our cognitive biases are going to get in the way if we like the player. In the draft, we're going to find ways to like them in Summer League, regardless of their performance. And if we didn't like a player uh, in the draft, we're going to find a way to hate on them, again, regardless of their performance. And then three, we're going to talk about all this stuff anyway. I mean, you know, those are those are three things that are going to happen anyway. So I'm just curious, because you're a big Cade Cunningham guy. Um, what, have you th- what, have you, what have you thought watching Cade Cunningham and Jalen Green uh, in the first couple of games? My biggest takeaway from both of them is that they're they're ready right now to play big NBA minutes today. And that's that's the biggest takeaway from both of them. I've been just as impressed with Jalen Green as I have been with Kay Cunningham. Um, I do think the Pistons are using Kay Cunningham wrong. I don't want to watch Detroit Pistons Summer League basketball to see Killian Hayes and Saban Lee run the offense. I want to see Kay Cunningham run the offense. So if you guys are listening to me, Pistons, Put Kay Cunningham on the basketball because Killian Hayes is not your point guard of the future. Uh, and Saban Lee definitely is not your point guard of the future. Give the ball to Kay Cunningham. Same thing with with the Orlando Magic at this point in Jalen Suggs. Give the ball to Jalen Suggs because he's clearly the best point guard on your roster. Okay, there I'm off of my soapbox. No, um, I, I, I look, that's what Pistons fans have been saying, and I think frustrating, right? Because yeah. it's it's contributed to maybe Cade not showing as well as we'd hoped he would show. I actually, by the way, think he's been just fine uh, in the summer yeah, league. He's, he's been, been shooting the fine. ball well. Um, he, he's There's nothing concerning to me, really, about what we've seen in the last couple of games. And and as you said, role does play, a, play, a, play an issue here with Cade. Jalen Green's been everything we thought he would be as a scorer, just an electric scorer. We're getting to see you know all of the bag. I thought the best performance from a rookie – that I saw was Jalen Suggs in that opening Absolutely. game against uh, Orlando Magic. I mean, that was the best case scenario. If you were a Jalen Suggs guy in game one, you got to see the very best of him hitting shots just all over the place. Uh, defensively, uh, I, I, he, he probably had to me the most per, uh, impressive performance of anybody. Um, he's been, he was tremendous in, in, in game one. Uh, I think Jalen Green has been tremendous um, in his two games. I love Jalen Green as as a pick and roll operator. He's he's a lot more advanced in the pick and roll than I thought he would be. Uh, obviously, he's really good in ISO. Uh, really confident kid. Jalen Suggs, you know, obviously, you know the the ability to make big shots. He he hit big shots down the stretch uh, in that game against the Warriors. Uh, the ability to defend, uh, he broke up that that three on one break, um, you know, by uh, blocking Moses Moody at the rim, um, you know, in in just the the pick and roll acumen, the maturity, everything that he does and that he brings uh, on both ends of the floor. Um, the Orlando Magic, they it, it it appears that they have found a good one. It appears that they found their franchise point guard. Jonathan Kaminga, a guy that we thought was going to take some time, 
Uh, we, we saw him as the Raw's prospect. Not bad. Uh, Not so bad far, at all. Uh, uh, he's, he's using his strengths to his advantage. You see, you see the weaknesses there. But as a physical player, that's really, really tough to stop when he's going downhill and, and charging towards the basket. Uh, he, he seems like he's taking advantage of the, the tools that he has now. And it makes me wonder whether he's going to get further along faster than maybe we thought. Well, I, I think, you know, Golden State's doing the opposite of what Detroit's doing with Cade. Like they're using Kaminga in the right way right now. Like right now he's a 4-3. So they're using him as a 4-3. And the the thing that pops with Kaminga, uh, two things pop with Kaminga. Number one, he is his athleticism is 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 just top end. Uh, he's a top end athlete. And number two, he plays hard from possession to possession. And that's a really rare skill, skill. And I really like the way Kaminga just goes after it. Uh, he's pretty relentless on both ends of the floor. Now, if we were playing under a real game and under a real whistle, he'd have some some foul issues. Yeah. But at the same time, this is what you want to see in summer league, right? Like you want to see, um, you you want to see the the baseline there. And if you're a Warriors fan, you got to be happy with with what what you what what you've seen out of him so far. The the, the potential is really there for him. I, I think that in some ways, seeing that to me personally, is more impressive than saying, oh, Davian Mitchell or Chris Duarte look great. They do, by the way, but at 24 and 23 years old, I would expect them to be much further along, especially in the summer league, where frankly, in some cases, they're still the oldest players on the on the court uh, than, than I would with a Jonathan Kaminga. Now, and, and with that said, Davian Mitchell has been everything we thought he would be defensively. Uh, Chris Duarte looks like you know, everything we thought he would be uh, early on. And, and they've both been really impressive in the summer league de- debuts. Yeah. And, and they're both where, where they make their most, where you can see it the most right now is defensively, right? Yeah. Both of those guys, see guys that are 19 years old, you know, Jalen Green's, Jonathan Kaminga's, um, they don't have a clue of how to play defense. And, and that's often what you have to, the, the one thing that you have to teach kids that age, you have to teach them how to play defense. And that that's, and that's what's been so, uh, for me, uh, so impressive about Jalen Suggs and Kay Cunningham. Both of those guys in summer league have been really good defensively. Kay Cunningham has been really good defensively. Jalen Suggs has been really good defensively. And both of those guys are really young. So when you get to Davion Mitchell and Chris Duarte, those guys are advanced defensively. Uh, Davion Mitchell uh, is going to be one of the best defensive guards in the league before very long. And, and of course, Duarte, um, you know, that was what we saw. And that was what we saw in, in, in at Oregon was his ability to defend, his ability to lock up through, through, through different positions. And he's shown all of that in summer league. Offensively, he's played the one, the two, the three. Uh, he's been really good there. Defensively, he's defended four positions. Uh, Chris, Chris Duarte probably, you know, even with his age, you can make a case that he probably should have gone even higher than four, 13. I, I I write in my my column on NBABigBoard.com about how our cognitive biases get in the way here. Guys that we like, we want to see them do well, and we can point to it early on and say, see, I told you. And guys that we like that don't do well, we say, look, Summer League doesn't really matter. you got to be patient. You know, you know, all of those different things. So I, I'm, I'm saying this as a qualifier, too. I really liked Scotty Barnes coming in. His first game in Toronto, I think, showed all the potential that was there for Scotty Barnes. Uh, I probably was a little bit higher at the end of the day on Alpern and Sengun. And, uh, you know, what Sengun has done early on has, has been impressive. I said I had a crush on Sharif Cooper. Uh, Sharif yeah. Cooper, you know, goes off and hits five out of eight from threes, including a buzzer beater, you know, for Atlanta. And Jalen you know, Johnson, I, baby. And then, and then I was going to refer to your guy, Jalen Johnson, who was referred to as Grant Hill at some point, looking like he should have been a top, you know, five, six pick in the draft based off of his early play in two games, you know, for the Atlanta Hawks. And so, you know, you want to be careful here. 
Uh, we're just there. These are very small sample sizes. These are not against NBA guys. And, and I'll give one example of where I'm trying to hold back my enthusiasm. Alperin and Sengun has looked great. The basketball IQ looks there. He absolutely looks like how in the world did this guy slide to 16 in the draft? He also was doing it against uh, Luca Garza. Uh, at, you know, at times the other night who who can't earn a minute on the floor in the NBA on the defensive end. He's not doing it against NBA athletes. He's not doing it against people who are going to be the guys in charge of defending him uh, in the NBA every night. And so we have to we have to tamp back the enthusiasm and say against against summer league competition, Sengun looks like a monster uh, right now and just his ability to do stuff. What will he look like against stronger, more athletic, um, more seasoned, better defenders in the NBA is just an answer we probably aren't going to get uh, in summer league because those guys aren't playing. So, I mean, the, the reason why, you know, Sengun fell to 16 is because he was so traditional, right? Like if this were 10 years ago, he'd be Ennis Cantor and he'd be a top three pick, um, you know, but you know, the things that he did in Turkey are the things that he's doing in summer league. And I expected, honestly, I expected him to be a little bit more advanced because he was playing against really good competition this year and he dominated really good competition this year. So this is for, for him, this is a step down. And, um, you know, <laughs> that's right. That's a, that's a great point, right? The competition yeah. level he's playing against right now is a step down from what he was playing in Turkey. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you can and you can see what made you like before the draft, everybody was like, well, you know, he's too traditional. He does his work with the back again, his back against the basket. You know, this is not how we play in the NBA today. These are our worries. We don't know how he can defend. And then on the other hand, it's like the old Alonzo morning me meme, meme where he's like, uh, and then and then they're like, well, you know what? This kid is still really freaking good. And that's the thing with, with, with him. Like he, like, okay, his strengths don't align with, you know, the style of play in the NBA. But when you look at his strengths, it doesn't mean that he's not going to be insanely productive at the NBA level. And you're seeing a glimpse of that in summer league. Yes, he plays with his back to the basket. No, he's not uh, a stretch out to three at this point, even though I think that he's going to eventually be a stretch out to three because I, I look at his shot and I think that, that his shot is going to come along. But at the same time, like he's got incredibly soft hands. He's got an incredible touch. He knows angles. He knows positioning. He rebounds the ball. He gets to the free throw line at a, at an astounding rate, or at least he's doing it in summer league. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, you just see uh, the baseline for, for the production there. And when he's playing with, you know, Kevin Porter Jr. and, and, and Jalen Green, and, and he's going to get a lot of, you know, as the years progress, he's going to get a lot of easy stuff, both in dump offs and in offensive rebound opportunities when those guys uh, draw two and three defenders going to the basket. So I expect him to have a productive NBA career. I feel a little bad for Jalen Johnson and Sharif Cooper, just that they, they both look really great in summer league. And you look at that stacked, Atlanta Hawks roster next year. And you wonder how either of those guys are going to get on the floor. Uh, not because they don't have talent, but just because the Hawks have a really deep now roster at point guard uh, that they have a, a really deep front uh, court uh, as well. And, uh, you know, this might be the case where falling in the draft, you know, may actually kind of really hurt your progression because you ended up falling to a team that just doesn't where their timeline is and just the roster that they have right now, it's going to be really hard for them to find time to develop you. And I think this could be one of the ones where we watch them in the summer league and they thrive. And then you're like, well, what happened to them when they got in the league? And it might not be their fault. Like it just may be they're They're on a really talented team that has, you know, championship aspirations in Atlanta. Yeah. You know, probably more Sharif Cooper than, than Jalen Johnson, because I think Jalen Johnson has a path to playing time and you know um 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 their forwards you know aren't the most durable forwards ever um and you know and and, and I, I think that you know over the course of an 82 game season um you're gonna look at 
uh, DeAndre Hunter, um, you, you know, he hasn't been the most durable guy. Uh, you're going to look at John Collins. He has, I mean, he was durable this year, um, but he's missed time in the past, you know, so, you know, I, I think that when you look at those guys, um, you know, I, I can see a path for, for Jalen Johnson, at least playing some minutes at some point in the season. Sharif Cooper, you know, I mean, I don't know. I, I agree with you there. I, I'm not sure. Uh, how much playing time he's he's gonna get? He's got um, Trey. He's got Darrell Wright. He's got um, Lou yeah. Williams. Just re-signed back with him. Uh, it's uh, it's it, when he was drafted, man, it looked like there was a perfect uh, <laughs> path to playing time yeah. there. Then free agency happens, and it's uh, it's a little bit tougher. Right, and but the Hawks have to be happy with what they've seen out of Sharif. I mean, that kid can handle the ball. He's a great pick and roll player. Um, you know, we are harped on his jump shot and, you know, throughout the entire pre-draft process and he's come out and made threes all over the place, uh, in, 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 in summer league, he hit a game winner, uh, you know, so he, he's a, he's a big game player. He's a dynamic guy. Uh, everything that, you know, everything that we thought he was off the dribble and pick and roll he's been, um, so, you know, he, he. I mean, it's it's a it's a good pick um, for for the Hawks to develop. I just I'm just not sure how much playing time he's going to get uh, right off the bat. One guy that you've been impressed with that we haven't talked about, Tony. Anybody else really stand out to you early on in summer league that you're like, wow? Um, okay. Um, you know, I'm I'm gonna, you know, this this guy has has gotten so much. Do, are, are we limited to rookies? Oh no, or you can I? go beyond rookies. All right, I'm a, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick two guys. Number one, Pat Williams looks fantastic. Yeah, and you know you know that that was my guy last year. Yeah. So when when I'm watching Patrick Williams, I'm I'm just like yes, nailed that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, he he's he's looked absolutely fantastic. He's absolutely taken taking a leap. He's been one of the best players in summer league. And, you know, I'm, I'm a highlight this guy because, you know, he's received so much criticism, uh, and, and so, you know, and, and he's, uh, caught so many stray, stray, stray bullets, um, you know, perhaps unfairly, but Udoka Azabuki has been absolutely fantastic in summer league. And, um, you know, I, I know that, Jazz fans look at him and they're like, you know, you should have been Jay McDaniels or you should have been Desmond Bain. Desmond Bain also has played very, very, very well uh, in this in this summer league. Um, but, you know, uh, Doke has been tremendous. He's been really good defensively. Uh, he's shown off some of the attributes that that really uh, attracted Dennis Lindsay to him uh, in terms of you know, the, the girth, the athleticism to go with the girth, um, the ability to finish, um, the ability to defend and drop big coverage. Uh, he's He's been absolutely terrific uh, for the Jazz in Summer League. And the Jazz throughout, uh, through their two, um, uh, through their two Summer Leagues are, are 4-0. and And he's been a linchpin of that. So I'm going to highlight him as well. All right. That's just a little recap of the first really week of the Vegas Summer League. We'll keep talking more about this in the podcast going forward. Uh, But we want to pivot now to the 2022 NBA draft and talk a little bit about that. But before we do so, I want to talk about Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questions and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand that their warehouse happens to carry? You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Save time and money using Rock Auto. Why choose to spend 30, 50, even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or car dealership? They have everything you could need, brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, and even new carpet. Go to rockauto.com and see all the parts available for your car or truck right locked on. And they're how did you hear about us box so they know we sent you amazing selection reliably low prices all the parts your car will ever need rockauto.com and i'm back with tony jones of the athletic we're talking we talked 2021 nba draft and and summer league stuff i want to pivot a bit to 2022 
uh, NBA draft. I just wrote a, a column on my website, nbabigboard.com, about who's number one in 2022. This is not going to be the case, I believe, like Kate Cunningham in 2021, where there was just an overwhelming front runner the entire time, a consensus number one guy. There's actually, when I was talking to NBA scouts, seven guys that got mentioned by scouts as potential number one prospects. Can in the I draft. guess? Can I yeah, guess? Yeah, go ahead, guess them. All right. Uh, Chad Holmgren. Yep. Uh, Paulo Banchero. How do I pronounce Correct. his name? Okay. AJ Griffin. He was not mentioned, actually, but we'll talk about why in a minute. Okay. Jaden Hardy, of course. Yes. Um, uh, da, 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 da. uh, let me think. Uh, was Peyton stuck? Not, I am getting stuck. Peyton Watson or no? Nope. Nope. No, no Peyton Watson. Caleb Houston? Okay. Caleb Houston. Okay. Tony's four okay. for six. Um, um, the kid from Purdue. I know, I know. Yep. Jaden Ivey. Yeah. Jaden Ivey. Ivey. Yes. Five for Definitely. seven. Jaden Ivey is really good, by the way. Um, okay. you're missing an international guy. Um, uh, you know what? His name escapes me. I know who you're talking y- about. Yannick, no, uh, y- Yannick yes. Zosa, uh, yes, who yeah. uh, p- plays in Spain from the Congo. And then yes. uh, you missed an obvious one, a guy that just reclassified and is going to play in uh, Memphis oh, this year. Right. And and I was going to ask you if he was going to – so Jalen Dern. Jalen so, Dern, right. Yes. Uh, and so those are the seven guys uh, that were talked about. Uh, Tony mentioned a couple of others that are definitely in the lottery conversation and might even move into that right now. Uh, and I love so, Peyton Watson. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. Peyton Watson is a guy that he loves. And uh, Adrian Griffin, we'll talk about, who's really just struggled with injuries. And I think the biggest hesitation yeah. from scouts on him was, let's see this guy, make sure he's back healthy, uh, you know, want to check him out. The doctors want to check him out, you know, with just a with, with just sort of a pass that's been littered with injuries, uh, making a little bit less comfortable talking about the number one pick in the draft, but certainly a top 10 guy. And And so, Tony... You told me kind of coming onto the show, you like this top five, top seven, as much as the 2021 NBA draft. Is that right? Yeah, I do. I mean, because you look at Chet Holmgren at the top and the reason why he's not, um, you know, the overwhelming number one um, favorite isn't because of him. It's because of his competition, right? Like Jalen Dern is tremendous. Paulo Benchero is tremendous. And, you know, if you want to see a 6'10", 240, 245-pound guy with ball skills, watch Paulo Benchero play basketball. And and the thing, like, and he's a tremendous rim protector. Uh, he's a really good shooter. Um, you know, it, it's – we haven't even mentioned Patrick Baldwin, you know, yeah. who's 6'10", six, six, uh, shooting small forward, you know, probably not as aggressive as those other guys, but you know, you see the like the skill set. Uh, and in you know, uh, Jaden Hardy is one of my favorite offensive players that come through the draft in a long time. Like, I think he's going to be one of those guys that at the apex of his career scores 30 points a game. Um, you know, and and Jalen Dern is a two way monster. Um, who was probably the best high school player um, um, in, 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 in the country uh, during the summer league circuit and during the summer circuit. And the reason why that's notable is because Amani Bates was also on that summer circuit and Jalen Durham was probably a better player than Amani Bates uh, throughout the spring and summer this year. And, and uh so there's a lot of great stuff, a lot of great stuff there. It's interesting when I talk to scouts, unlike last year, where they saw Jalen Green, they saw um, Cade Cunningham, and to a certain extent, Evan Mobley and said, look, these guys are tier one guys. We're comfortable talking about them as tier one guys before the season even begins. There was a lot of hesitancy in talking to scouts about this year for a couple of reasons. One, COVID limited 
the, the scouting opportunities that they had on this particular class, more so than any other class that they've ever seen. Uh, it, it also limited playing opportunities for some of these prospects in uh, you know, non-traditional seasons, non-traditional summer settings where you typically would see some of these prospects. And so there's a question mark there. And I think the other thing is while I think there's maybe seven, eight guys in this draft that grade out as potential tier two prospects, which is awesome. Those are potential all-stars for those of you that follow the tiers. No one was comfortable saying Chet or Paolo or Jalen Duran were tier one prospects yet. And, and so that's where I see a, a little bit of a difference. I think we came in to the 2021 draft feeling like Cade, Jalen Green, Evan Mobley, that's where they already were as prospects. I think teams are and scouts are just pushing back a little bit, not sure that there's the sure things that are coming out of this draft the same way. Um, do you feel the same way or do you feel like, no, there's some tier one guys. I'm really confident that fill in the blank is going to be a tier one guy in the NBA. Well, you know, I understand the hesitancy with, with, with Chad Holmgren. Um, I think that, you know, the question is, does his body fill out? Right. Like, you know, where does his where does his body fill out? And and you know, probably on some level, can he score enough at the NBA level to to be a tier one prospect? Because, you know, you have to do obviously you have to do everything, but you also have to score as well. But, you know, I'm comfortable with 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 Chet um um as a tier uh, as a tier two, tier one prospect. Um, just because I think that he does so many things that are really unicornish, like everything that people think that Kristaps Porzingis is, but he isn't, that's what Chet actually is mm. like, um, you know, Chet can defend on the perimeter. He can move his feet side to side. He's a tremendous passer. He's a great ball handler. Uh, he's a good shooter. Um, you know, he plays hard. Like he's a, he has, he's a dog. Uh, he's a competitive kid and he plays hard from possession to possession and he competes, um, you know, and he makes an impact without the ball in his hands. So, but I understand where the hesitancy is like, he's real thin. So how much does he fill out? You know, he probably needs to gain 40 pounds. If he gains 40 pounds, how much does that sap his mobility? What does that help do with his mobility? So I do understand the hesitancy there. Let's talk about Chet uh, for just a little bit longer because he, he's probably the favorite um, right now. If there's if there's a guy that you hear number one pick in this class, it's probably Chet. And and I think you do a really nice job of sort of laying out why there might be concerns about him. One of the things that's really interesting in watching his tape is even though he's painfully thin, and I'm not sure that he his frame is capable of putting on that 40 pounds of muscle, I, I think he's going to be a thin player. He's wiry strong. Right. And, and, and so there's this sort of physical strength that we think about. So uh, Banquero, for example, like looks like he's strong. I mean, he's got tree trunks for legs and, and Jalen Duran looks strong. Like they're, they're strong. But sometimes guys can be slight and still strong. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Kevin Garnett sort of comes to mind as a guy that, you know, physically never really filled out, never became, you know, a buff or, or you know, looking strong, but functionally was strong. Allen Iverson, as a guard, uh, you know, weighed, what, 160 pounds, but was functionally, you know, strong and, and wiry tough. And that's one thing about Chet that gives me a little bit more hope is it's not just about adding weight so that you don't get pushed around like he he competes like you said he's sort of a dog out there he he doesn't really back down to anybody and there's some functional strength that's there even though like when you look at it on his frame he he clearly needs to get stronger and so i i think he's he's one of the most fascinating prospects that we've ever had to really rate at this high of level uh it, it's sort of you know and i had a scout you know, tell me, is he, is he going to be Kevin Garnett or is he going to be Poku? And, you know, those, you know, you know, when you he's look at Poku, Poku. And, uh, yeah. And, and, and there's Tony Jones saying, you know, he's not going to be, uh, I, I think teams are really 
interested to see how he does against now the NCAA competition. As you said, his level of competition may be not quite as strong, though he was actually excellent for Team USA in the under-19 World Cups uh, for them. You can make an argument he was their best player uh, on that on that team. He wasn't their best scorer, but just their overall best player on the, on the gold medal team for the under-19 um, you know, World Cup. So uh, he certainly was able to, to do that and went up against, you know, one of the uh, the probably the number one prospect in 2023. In the world, yeah. Uh, yeah, and maybe in the world, like would be the number yeah. one prospect in this draft um, if he was there. Uh, and and, and Bonquero is the guy that probably right now you hear as his main competition for the number one pick in the draft. Uh, how do you rate him as an NBA player? You got a comp for him yet? So my comp for, for, for Chet is definitely Kevin Garnett. I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, um, Paolo Banchero, he kind of reminds me a little bit. So Jalen Duren reminds me of Chris, a, a young Chris Webber. That's who he reminds me of. Um, um, Paolo Banchero, it's interesting. I don't know that I have a comp for him because it's, it's like, He's got a mix. Okay, so you look at him, right? And you see how physically big he is. And then you look at his ball skills and you look at like he 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 just has the skill set of somebody so much smaller. And I'm I'm just not sure that I've seen that. And then, you know, I I, I look at him defensively and I'm like, oh well, you know, he can actually protect the rim as well. Um, you know, he's 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 kind of unique to me. Um, because he's going to come out, he's going to make threes, he's going to handle the ball, he's going to, you know, cross people over, you know, I mean, he's going to do stuff that you just shouldn't see um, normally out of, out of guys his size. All right, I, 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 got in t- I got in trouble in my column for quoting scouts that were talking about two guys, um, both controversial. One is Zion might be a guy that you think about who was just physically big and strong that was actually incredibly skilled in all sorts of ways that we're just not used to. Now, Paolo Banquero doesn't have that explosive elite athleticism of Zion. So they're different players because Zion also was just a freak athletically on top of, you know, the physical strength and and you know the skill set, which is which is a very different um set, but as far as like a big guy who can do a lot of different things, you know, maybe there's some comps there. The other one for scouts that aren't as high on him, and there are some scouts that are worried about him, was Jabari Parker. Um, And their concern was they loved Jabari in high school. They loved him at Duke. He was the number two pick in the draft. But as Jabari got heavier uh, and just sort of, you know, physically got stronger, his mobility and his explosion you know, decreased uh, in the NBA to the part that he ultimately, you know, struggled defensively and just wasn't quite the prospect that he looked out of high school uh, and that there's some concerns with with Banquero that maybe Jabari is a is is a comp and a, a bit of a cautionary tale on him. How, how do you feel about that? Um, what I would say is that Boncaro Boncaro is a lot bigger than Jabari at the same stage and. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, at the same stage, Jabari was a three, two and, you know, we are like, okay, he's a three could possibly play some two. Uh, he was an elite athlete coming out of high school. Um, um, or at least an elite athlete vertically. Um, you know, you could see it in his freshman year, like Jabari would, would grab a rebound and he would just push and transition and boom, like he would just he would he would be at the basket from one end to the other in in two or three dribbles and it it was it was special to watch um but we know what bond carroll is he's like a four or five right but he's like a four or five that can handle the ball um and shoot the ball but still he's a four or five so we're you know i don't think anybody's gonna you know miscast him as as you know, putting him on the on the perimeter on either end of the floor, he's going to play on the perimeter offensively, but defensively, he's going to be guarding fours and fives. And I think that he can easily, if he if he you know gets up to two sixty or two sixty five or something like that, you know, he can easily transition 
uh, to center once once he gets to the NBA. So I don't know that I see uh, that specific issue out of him uh, that we had with Jabari Parker. Okay, that's Chet Holmgren. It's, it's Paulo Banquero. Uh, when we return, we'll talk about a couple of other guys that uh, we're thinking about as potential number one picks in the in the 2022 uh, NBA uh, draft, including uh, Jaden Hardy um, and uh, and. Uh, We'll talk about Yannick Zosa as well. Uh, before we do so, did you know that Built Bar has nine delicious flavors plus the occasional limited time flavor? When we talk to Built Bar fan, they're definitely passionate about their faves. If you don't know the Built Bar flavors, well, you're missing out. Coconut, coconut almond, cherry, raspberry, mint brownie, peanut butter brownie, double chocolate, salted caramel. There's something for everyone. My personal favorite, I'm a coconut guy, tastes like a Mounds Bar. These are delicious. They're chewy. Uh, they're not chalky at all. They don't taste like a protein bar. However, they're healthy. Uh, They have 17 grams of protein, only 130 calories, only four grams of sugar, only four grams of net carbs. Order today and get the raspberry or mint brownie or whatever you like. Go to BuiltBar.com and use promo code LOCK15. You'll get 15% off your first order. Use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at BuiltBar.com. I'm back with Tony Jones of The Athletic. We are talking 2022 NBA draft. Let's go into a guy that you said could be a potential 30 point a night scorer. The G League is essentially getting their Jalen Green all over again. This time it's a Jaden instead of a Jalen. Uh, Jaden Hardy, uh, who is the who is the crown jewel in the G League's recruiting class this year, uh, probably the best scorer in this draft. What do you like about uh, about Jaden Hardy? Uh, offensively, everything. I don't think that I don't think that he has a weakness offensively. Uh, he's a tremendous ball handler, uh, tremendous competitor. Uh, just really competes um, from play to play offensively. Uh, great shooter, um, NBA body already. Uh, so you don't have to worry about you know. With Jalen Green, there's a little bit like okay, you know, you can see that he needs to put on some weight or you know get in the weight room a little bit. I don't see that with, with Jaden Hardy. Uh, scores at all three levels, gets to the basket, plays with force. I mean, offensively, he's he's just really uh, a total package. And you can play him, you know, he's similar to Kevin Porter Jr., where you can play him at the one or the two. You can give him the ball in his hands or, or you can play him off the ball. So um, he's he's a plus athlete. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's really – he, he's he's a really special offensive talent. So, yeah, I I, uh, I I I like him quite a bit. It's it's interesting uh, because we got Jalen Green last year, who was the you know guy that's going to average twenty five points a game. Then you know Jaden Harvey Hardy comes out of the G League, sort of a similar profile, not quite the explosive athlete that Jalen Green is, but as right. you say, physically the body's there and a little bit more versatile. Uh, than Jalen Green and his ability to kind of play 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 the one, some passing skills there as well. Do you like him better than Jalen Green? As a um, uh, you know, I, it's interesting now that I've gotten to watch Jalen Green. I like him quite a bit um, because um, the one thing I like about Jalen Green is is how well he handles the ball and how mature his game is. And Jaden Hardy has some of the same maturity. Uh, uh, to Jaden Hardy has some of the same maturity to his game that that Jalen Green has. I think they're the same level of prospect. I don't know that I want to put one over the other. Um, I do think that, you know, I don't know that that Jaden Hardy goes number two next year, and that's the thing, right? Like, you know, he's going to have to leap, you know, Bonchero, which is possible. And he's going to have to leap Jalen Dern, which is also possible. Um, but and I mean, Chad. there's a lot. And, you know, I mean, I was saying number two, like Jalen Green. Um, yeah. But you I, know, I, this... I think this no, is ahead. interesting, Tony, because last year in 2021, we saw wings dominate the lottery. We saw one big Evan Mobley, uh, you know, in the in the lottery. That that was it, uh, and and only three bigs really drafted. Period in the first round right now. 
you get the 2022 class coming in that's loaded with bigs at the top, Duran, Holmgren, uh, Bonquero, uh, Zosa. Um, and you just sort of wonder, given the league's emphasis on wings and scoring guards and seeing value in those positions, do those guys end up dropping down a little bit in the draft just because teams themselves are prioritizing getting getting wings like a Caleb Houston or, you know, a scoring right. guard uh, like um, like Hardy in this draft. I think that's going to be really one of the most interesting questions because where they've been ranked in their high school rankings doesn't reflect where the priorities are for NBA teams right now and what sort of prospects they're looking at. And we I think we saw that really clearly in the 2021 NBA draft. And I'm not sure that trend's going to change in right. in in 2022, where you might get Caleb Houston leapfrogging some guys, uh, because or Jaden Ivey leapfrogging some guys just because of positional value. Where where are you at with Sosa in 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 terms of you know in terms of where he stacks up in terms of you know w- w- what his what his skill set value is because yeah. you know I I think he's he's quite the prospect and I think he's you know, I, I think he's going to be really interested in the track over over I, this year. I I think if he was in college basketball, we would be seriously talking about him as the favorite to be the number one pick in the draft because what he's doing at seventeen in the ACB, the Spanish league, which is the best league in Europe right now, is historic. There's really only two other guys that have done this, and one is Luka Doncic, and well, the other is Ricky Doncic's Rubio. Right. Right. Um, Ricky Rubio and Luka Doncic. And that's it. He's He was playing pro ball at 16 uh, over in Spain. Uh, he is one of the best young defensive players I've ever seen. He's got, you know, Rudy potential on, on the defensive end. And it's not just because of length and athleticism and motor. It's also just a very high level of feel um, for the game and sort of how to how to play the game. The offense is still coming along and, and you know, you can see that he's rawer there, but the fact that he plays as hard as he does, um, the fact that he's just everywhere on the court. And then when you hear this young man's story and you hear about his, his move from the Congo, uh, you know, to playing professional basketball, uh, you know, speaks five languages, um, and has just handled himself at this level in Spain. You know, I had one scout say this to me. Do you think Chet Holmgren could do what Yannick Zosa is doing in the ACB right now? Uh, and by the way, they're almost a year and a half. He's almost a year and a half younger. Do you think Chet younger. would be doing that in the ACB? And the answer is, I don't think so. I, I absolutely don't. And if and Zosa was over in college basketball playing for Gonzaga this year, uh he he probably would destroy everybody um, that that's there, and so it will be really interesting now that we're seeing. Let's say Singun looks as good in the regular season as he does in the summer league. Again, the argument's going to be made that we got to take these international players that are producing at this level professionally seriously, and that you know it's a little bit like comparing apples and oranges. And so I'm I'm extremely high on him. Uh, I, I think he should definitely be in the conversation for the number one pick. And I would say if it wasn't for the position, if it wasn't that the NBA was so heavy on wings and and scoring guards right now, I would say he should be the favorite to be the number one pick in the draft. I think his positional value is probably the thing that hurts him the most in that argument. What about you? So, you know, this is why Luka Don. This is one of the reasons why Luka Doncic fell to the third pick or wherever pick he. He felt this is why he wasn't the first pick, right? Like we didn't like there were too many people who were like, oh, well, you know, he's he's dominating, you know, the ACB and, and this is not the NBA. He's not going to be able to, to to separate in the NBA. He's not going to be able to do this. He's not going to be able to do that. And we we're just like, dude, this is the second best league in the world. He's. 17 18 years old he was the mvp like this just does not happen you got to take him first and that's one of the reasons why you know luka luka Doncic wasn't there and it, you know some in, in some ways if you're out of sight you're out of mind and that's just the way that we are as human beings um 
you know, I agree with you in, in terms of in terms of uh, defense. He's one of the best defensive prospects, um, probably to come through the draft uh, in a long time. And and you know, by the way, I put Chad Holmgren up there as well. I, I think Chad Holmgren is an elite elite defensive prospect. Um, the thing that I like about Zosa is you know how hard he plays from possession to possession. Um, he does not take possessions off on either end of the floor. Uh, the offense has to come, but he battles offensively. Um, you know, he's he's uh, an elite athlete. He runs the floor like a deer. Uh, he, he rebounds on both ends of the floor. Um, you know, so he's a guy that, that I think that if you put him in, you know, the spacing of the NBA, um, you know, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's going to, to prove, prove valuable on both ends. He's going to prove valuable on the offensive end with his athleticism and defensively, he's going to prove valuable because he can stay in front of people. And I'm talking about when I say in front of people, I think he's going to be able to stay in front of, you know, some of the quickest players that we have in our league right now. It, it, it's a, it's really incredible. It's sort of like, you know, we talked about Garuba, who is an incredible defensive prospect, also coming out and playing at a big level. Right, but, but imagine him being bigger four, than four, Garuba. four right. inches taller four inches than Garuba. Taller, right, exactly. And and much more advanced offensively than Garuba was, uh, you know, coming out. He He's definitely already well ahead of Garuba at this point, and he's younger. And and, and it's uh, it, it, it really is a... To me, he's the sleeper in all of this, and let's see who gets the number one pick. But um, you know, a team that's not going to be able to shy away from you know drafting an international player or whatever. I, I think there's going to be less pressure than there was this year with you know the Cade being number one guy. I, I think he's got a shot. Let's talk quickly about returning Jaden Ivy. This 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 uh, sophomore, junior, senior class super depleted by the 2021 NBA draft. Not a lot of guys that look like lottery picks left, but Jaden Ivy out of Purdue to me looks like not just a lottery pick, but a guy who, who could also be an impact player that could, could rise as high as number one team. People loved him for team USA under 19s, elite athlete defensively. There seems like the jump shot is this and gets to the basket finishes above the rim it just seems like the the jump shot is the swing skill right now that is the difference between him being, you know, a, a good seven to, you know, 10, 12 pick and then being like a one through five, five pick in this draft. I will say he is the most unPurdue like Purdue player I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> like I have never seen an elite athlete come out of Purdue and is like, and I'm talking about going all the way back to, to I'm a, Tony Jones, you know, who played at Purdue in, in the late eighties. Um, you know, I, you know, I mean, it just seemed like Gene Katie, Matt Painter, they always recruited guys that were, that were really good basketball players, but not, not great athletes. And he's a great athlete. And, um, you know, I, I think if he, the jump shot comes along, uh, and you know, the handle comes along, uh, a little bit, um, you know, he's, he's got a chance to be, you know, a dominant point guard type player, uh, in the league, um, defensively he's there for me. Um, you know, I, I wonder about him a little bit in pick and roll, but I think he's tremendous in transition. Uh, I thought he was the best player to go back to school this year, right? Like I thought he was the best college basketball player to go back to school. I thought he made a leap. Uh, I thought he was great in the under 19s. Um, I thought that you could make, um, I honestly thought that you could make a, a case that he was the best player in the under 19s. I still think it would, I still would vote Chet, but I, I think he was up there. Like, I think he made big plays throughout the, the entire tournament. Shout out to Kenny Lofton Jr. as well, because he was, he was like, that's like one of my favorite plays. He's my spirit. We'll, we'll talk about Kitty point. later. Uh, <laughs> what sort of NBA prospects he has because he's he's yeah. such a talented kid and as uh, yeah. uh, you know, I, and just uh, he's he's a it, the weight issue is going to be you know the question how right. teams are going to get comfortable with him. Last guy, Caleb Houston, played for Canada in the under 19s. He's got the big W next to his name, Wing. You Wayne, know, if you're talking right. about. You're talking about wings and the NBA's obsession with wings. 
Houston, you could, there's several other guys you could talk about um, there, you know, uh, Peyton, uh, uh, you could talk about um, uh, Patrick Baldwin, you know, as, as wings, but Houston seems to be the favorite of scouts because of the combination of size, length, right. shooting ability, and then he really defense, gets after it defensively. Defense. And uh, in the under 19s, his shot wasn't falling, which I think teams aren't concerned about. He can shoot the basketball, but he made up for it by just playing out of his mind on the defensive end as well. Uh, What are your feelings about Houston? I mean, you know, I look at him and I I see Patrick Williams a little bit, you know. Um, I I think Patrick's, you know, a little thicker, um, um, but... You know, I love the way he defends. I love the way he competes on that. And there was one play that I watched uh, in the other 19s where he got beat. Like, he got he got beat. He, uh, he recovered. Um, he, 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 uh, he, he defended the rim. Uh, he, he defends. The, and the thing that I like about him defensively is not only is he a good on-ball defender, but he's a good team defender. And there's a real difference there. Like there's, there are people who are good on ball players who aren't. I think we lost Tony um, there. Tony, can we hear you? Okay, it looks like we lost Tony Jones uh, there at the end as he was talking about Caleb Houston. And I think that that's... Uh, you know, uh, uh, we were wrapping up anyway, are talking about our 2022 uh, NBA draft prospects. And so we appreciate Tony coming on. Uh, look forward to coming back uh, next week and again, breaking down some of the summer league stuff and talking about uh, who is helping themselves, who is hurting themselves in the summer league, as well as diving into returning college basketball players, uh, the freshmen. Uh, so much more to come on Chad Ford's NBA Big Board. You've been listening to Chad Ford's NBA Big Board on the Locked On Podcast Network. Aloha.